uh, I think it was USA Today, <clears throat> had a survey that revealed that 53% of Americans felt their life was dull and boring. 53%. I'm looking out at you and seeing who those might be. <laughs> dull and boring. Well, you get to a certain age, dull and boring isn't so bad, right? You're like, I want dull and boring. Yeah, you're like immediately, no more surgeries. <clears throat> We're feeling okay. Action America recently reported that America's number one in both highest per capita income and number of people who are discontent with life and pessimistic about the future. Ooh. There's a combo, and yet so much of us is convinced that if I had more, I'll be more content. And me even saying that, a lot of us go, oh, no, no I know that's not true. No, I think that we think it. If I just had, if this were just better, or if I had this, my life is more content. Well, apparently, if we're number one in the world, highest per capita income, and also with discontent and pessimistic people, I guess maybe not. Maybe that's not true. So think for a minute on a scale one to ten, one being I'm not content, one is like Eeyore. Oh, not a very good day to live. That's one, and ten would be, no, this is, I'm killing it. I just think things are amazing. Think for a minute. What would you be on the scale of one to ten? How do we enjoy a truly satisfied life? Where is that found? That's a fair question. Where is that found? Where is contentment in satisfaction actually found. So in the midst of your absolutely fantastic life or less than, in the midst of making money or losing money, whichever you're best at, we, we have a skill. We can learn to be content in any situation. That's the phrase from Philippians. It's wrapping up a book that has talked a lot about joy. That was the subject. There's a whole lot about joy in Philippians, and now he comes right out and says it, I have learned that I am content in any situation. That's profound. So before we read Philippians chapter 4, starting in verse 10, let's pray. <clears throat> Father, thank you for the privilege of joining as a family together today. Would you help us learn to be even more content and satisfied in our life than we were before we walked in today? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take a look. If you have a Bible there, it's Philippians 4, verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. How are we content? How do we find satisfaction in life? I'm going to suggest three, and the first one in your notes is to be thankful. It's a spirit of gratitude. Look at that line. It's almost like it's a little backhanded. It's not. But he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. Well, it doesn't mean that he, it means they, they hadn't had concern. But I'm grateful now that your concern for me has been revived. You were concerned, but you didn't have opportunity. Well, you got to unpack that. He goes, I am really happy that you're now finally helping me. But I understand that you didn't have the opportunity before. 
So it's okay. I'm not holding anything. There's a gratitude here. Appreciate the help that you are receiving. I'll give you a, a great tip that we're not living with a spirit of gratitude is then we look around and, and are critical of people who don't help us enough. I have been there myself. I'm suffering. I'm going through a very difficult time, and no one else seems to care. I mean, I can tell you instances. I remember sitting <clears throat> with somebody over lunch or a coffee that I'm going through a life-changing issue, and we got over that conversation in about three minutes, and we're talking about a car that he wants to buy. And I'm like, my life is in the balance and yet, you care enough that you're just, you brought it up, but that's it. I want the thankfulness and gratitude of Paul that said, hey, whatever amount that you help is great. The fact that the guy was sitting with me for coffee should have been enough and grateful. I was on the phone literally two weeks ago. A friend of mine, his wife is, is younger than us. She weighs 57 pounds. Can't get her into the psych ward because physically it's not getting figured out. 57. He's crying on the phone, and truthfully, his language is colorful, and, and I'm listening and going, oh, this is… And we talk for a few, and then he actually is gaining composure, and he said… He goes, hey, how, how's Sarah doing? How, how are the kids? And I literally said, honestly, Brad, it doesn't matter how my wife and kids are doing right now. I said, this is unbelievable. He goes, oh, I know. But I have to get my mind on things. And I'm, I'm learning. It's, I was learning from him. Just appreciate whatever help somebody's giving, and if they're not giving you any help, well, then they don't have opportunity. Maybe they're facing something as bad as you, or worse, or to them it's worse. It's gratitude. The Bible says these kinds of things, that we're to give praise and be thankful for God in everything. Ephesians 5, in all circumstances, with all of our hearts, with all our words, singing with joy. This is like, I should have known this earlier in life. I don't know how I missed it. And so, man, you're going to hear this and you're going to say, oh, yeah, we all knew. I didn't know how significant gratefulness is to somebody who is suffering from depression. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was so much from secular counselor to Christian counselor to psychiatrists. I've had events where we put on for de depression, and I'm kind of backstage talking, and I'm almost getting eye rolls when I said, hey, I heard that, like, gratitude, developing a spirit of gratitude is helpful for somebody who's struggling with depression. And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, there's no, no doubt about that. And I'm like, well, where were you <laughs> earlier in life? <clears throat> How am I just now figuring this out? I didn't know that. There's a gal named Karen Bouchard. She's an author, Christian speaker. She said, some days I could barely put one foot in front of another, and I found the greatest help in finding ways to say I'm grateful. Oh, yeah, because God said, be grateful and thankful in everything, in all circumstances, with all of your heart, with words, with singing. If you're struggling with forms of depression, I am all for seeking out uh, medical help. That's a 
that's a very important, could be something physiological, get all the tests, the blood tests. Don't they love to do blood tests? Can't you get it out of one vial? Why did we need 20 vials? I'm going to run out. It's a great idea if you're struggling. If you know somebody who's struggling, yeah, get them a physical checkup. Find a great Christian counselor somewhere. Do exercise. There's that list. You know the list, right, of what to do. But put within that something we can all cultivate, and it's the spirit of gratefulness. To those who are discontent, there tends to be a, a blaming, a complaining of all that I don't have, of all those who are not helping. Henry Nowen said something really deep. He said, when we look for contentment in people, we will always end up critical of people because they'll never give enough. So if you're expecting out of your spouse to be fulfilled and content and satisfied, you'll end up critical of your spouse because they can't do it. The boss that isn't giving you enough satisfaction of job performance and they're not, yeah, keep looking for it and keep increasing your disappointment and being critical because they're not saying enough. So Henry Nouwen gave a wonderful little tip, a little principle. He said, all of our contentment and all of our satisfaction is, of course, from God. When somebody offers it to you, it could be so small. They speak a word of encouragement. They do something that lifts your spirit immediately receive it with grace and kindness and look in your heart to God and thank Him and have Him fulfill it. Now all of a sudden we appreciate it. The coffee with that guy. I'm struggling in life with one of the biggest things I had faced at that point and now he wants to talk about a car. Well, how much would have been enough from him? How much? No, it was amazing that he sat with me. It's amazing that we talked, and in hindsight, pretty amazing that he got his mind off of it. Talk about cars. I'm never going to get enough from anybody. It's always going to be from God. So we need to be thankful to develop contentment in life. But now look at the secret. It's point two. Two times he says in this passage that it's learned. Look at verse 11. He says, not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I'm in to be content. And then again, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance. I've learned this. So let's let the dust settle on this for a second. Do we teach our kids, do we teach ourselves that contentment and satisfaction in life is something to be learned? Let me give you the contrast, and this is going to be way too familiar. It's way too familiar for me. Or do we deep down believe that our satisfaction and our contentment in life is when something particular happens or when I get something or I own something, when something is completed, that my satisfaction and contentment rises? When I can finally get that job that I really want, my satisfaction, contentment level is going to be there. When I have the family in place, when I have the right friends, if I could win the lottery, that would solve, that would bring heavy contentment. I had a friend who said, money doesn't bring happiness, but it makes my sorrow much more comfortable. But I think we've bought it. I think that we generally have bought it. 
We will be more satisfied after this health crisis is over. Oh, I'll be more comfortable, but more satisfied and content? Do you remember who it is that we're talking about? Paul, who was confined, he was under arrest, falsely accused, dim future, lonely, and he said, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation. <laughs> like, I'm there. Would you rather not be under arrest? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. But my contentment, that's not at stake. This is remarkable. This is a literally a paradigm shift of which we have bought into what the world thinks. Money's higher, contentment's higher. The family, if I could just get married, if I could just have a kid, somehow I've not made it. I don't have access to that contentment because I'm lacking in whatever it is that we're lacking. And he says, no, it's not that way. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned, learned in whatever situation I am in to be content. Remarkable. He learned it. There's a, one of my favorite verses is 1 Timothy 6. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Well, of course, that's a great verse. It's Paul talking to Timothy, who also was losing everything and ultimately his life. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So we know this. I'll put it in context and how we can see it. Um, in Arizona, there's new developments going up all over the place. There is a new one going in in West, the West Valley in Buckeye that, are you ready for the staggering numbers? This development is building 100,000 homes. <laughs> is that nuts? 55 million square feet of commercial space, and they're expecting 300,000 people. Okay, how many of you have gone through model homes? Just walk through them, just for the fun, curiosity. That is like the number one way to be discontent with your house. <laughs> Am I right? You go through a model home, and you're like, oh, this would be, and you walk home, and you're like, I feel like I'm living in a tent, <laughs> and not a very nice tent. I mean, that's what it does. That's what, that's what test driving a car would be. You had no idea those amenities are on a car. It's so quiet. It's so smooth. And you're just getting in your old car. We're built that way. I will be happier with more. I will be more satisfied if things around me are better. The beautiful story of Philippians is joy in Christ is available every single day with us in a relationship with God. It's enough. Oh, I'm going to enjoy the fine things in life, enjoy a nice lunch and dinner, and drive a decent car. It's all good. It's the expectation that those things will bring satisfaction, and they will not. I love saying this because it's the only time we're going to hear it all week. Every commercial, every sitcom, they're happy when they get back together. They're happy when they find someone. They happy. It's all teaching us contrary it's never enough. We only have our satisfaction in Him. The book of Philippians is full of it. Jesus is our life, even through challenges, uncertain future, oppressing people. 
You and I think, I'm going to be more satisfied when this oppressing person is gone. Oh, it'll feel better. But contentment is available even while suffering under the oppressing person. The prize of knowing Christ. This is good news, by the way, because if your contentment is contingent on good health, it's out of your hands. If your contentment as a parent is that your kids are happy and healthy, I got bad news for you. Your contentment is on the verge, and then you'll lose it. You think of it all. If, if I could just have the perfect family, if I could just have this and this and this, everything's okay. None of those things are in your hands. Yeah, you got the great job that you thought was the perfect job, but that job's gone. It's on to, oh no, so satisfaction is delayed. No, it's available all the time through our relationship with God and faith in Jesus Christ. Take a look at this third verse. It's probably the most famous verse in Philippians. I can do all things through him, through Jesus, who strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I remember seeing uh, Tim Tebow with that under his, um, you know, the black under the eyes in football. He had Philippians 4.13. I can do all things. If all things meant a two mediocre seasons in the NFL, if that's what that means, because that's what he got out of it, I mean, is that what it is? You can buy a Steph Curry poster <clears throat> of him being remarkable on a basketball court with the verse on it that says, I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. You can buy that. Is that what it means? Is that, is that what it means that you can do anything? This is what we often tell our youth. You can do anything you set your mind to, which is, by the way, not true. And the sooner we learn that that's not true, we have one of our three kids that I'm pretty sure if he set his mind into being a bus driver, right, you better hope he's not because he can't see. What, is that, is that, oh, so is he limited? Can he not now do anything through Christ that strengthens him? The beautiful context of this passage is the story of fulfillment in life and contentment in circumstances that are very painful and ever-changing, that you and I can do this. You want to learn how to be content? I can do this through Christ that strengthens me. It's the context of the passage. This is so freeing. The race to achieve, the race to work up this ladder that as soon as you get to a new level, and so many of us in this room know this, as soon as you get to a new level, there's three more levels that you didn't even know existed. So you could actually make all of this progression only to find out that you feel like you're further behind. Hey, no, stay on that path. Enjoy the path, but not for the sake of contentment and satisfaction. Stay on it for the sake that you want to excel and do the very best that you can. Absolutely. But your life is not at stake. Satisfaction is not at stake. That is available today. That's available as we daily trust our Heavenly Father for a relationship with Him. Nobody can take that away. That's why Paul could be in house arrest, uncertain future, lost everything. This guy was on the top of life as a Jewish leader. He now has nothing. Would well, you think that was easy for him? No. He said, I had to learn. I had to learn to be content in any situation that I find myself in. It's fantastic. We need to press on 
I can do all things through him who strengthens me. It's pressing on. There was, um, did anyone watch the Oscars last Sunday night? Come on, just be honest. Good job. I'm proud of you. Curious what's going on out there. She really the only one that watched the Oscars? You people. Was it good? Eh. All right. It was the 96th Oscar Awards. There was, I think, the highlight. I didn't watch it. I watch highlights. I watch the Cliff Note version. A great actor who's been in 72 films. This is going to be a test to see who you know I'm talking about. He's in 72 films since he was five. His films have grossed over $15 billion. Won his first Oscar Sunday night. Who was it? No? I know, because he looks like he's up there all the time. It's Robert Downey Jr., his first Oscar. This was the line that he gave. There's been a lot on this this week, on this line, because it's so deep. He said, I'd like to thank my terrible childhood and the academy in that order. Wow. I would like to thank my terrible childhood and the academy in that order. Terrible childhood, I guess I didn't know. I don't follow some of this, so I don't know his story. This is what Inc.com said. Think of the hardest times in your life, the truly terrible experiences you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Can you find a reason to express gratitude for them? Inc.com is not a Christian website. This is understood. Let me read that again. Think of the hardest times in your life, the truly terrible experiences you wouldn't wish on your worst enemy. Can you find a reason to express gratitude in them? Robert Downey Jr. was addicted to substance abuse so bad that producers could barely get insurance for him to act in his movies. He was such a risk. Robert Downey Jr. began using drugs at age eight, thanks to his father who gave them and introduced him and taught him. He dropped out of high school, history of gun charges, drug treatment, prison time, parole. Robert Downey Jr. Okay, let's go back to his, I'd like to thank my terrible childhood in the academy. That's gratitude. I don't like what's happened to you in your past is painful. We could get everyone in this room to cry so fast with some of your stories, if not many of your stories. It's horrible. Where's contentment in life? It's become so driving that we reach for everything and anything to fill those emptiness and that need. Philippians has taught us it's found in the person of Jesus Christ. Yeah, but what do I do about my past? So says the Bible, secular counseling, Christian counseling, be grateful. That very same friend of mine who's been asking for prayer for his dear wife I helped edit his book, his life story, and about anything that could go wrong went wrong. I mean, it became comical. How could your life be this bad? And we're just charting chapter after chapter after chapter, and I'll never forget one day sitting with him, and I actually asked the question, just curious, to go back and change something, what would be the first thing you'd change? Fair question? Yeah. Like that, he goes, nothing. I wouldn't be here today where I am, how I am, if not for every bit of that. Hated it. 
His dad died right in his arms when he was a little kid. It just goes on and on and on. It's gratitude. Develop gratitude. Appreciate what God has done. His hand is on you. Those dark days, he could have stopped them. He didn't. I don't know why. I have no idea. But we can trust him. Our contentment and satisfaction in life is found only in a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. Not in our church, not anybody's church. Not in money, not in good things, not in addictions. It's found in a relationship with God. And in our relationship with God, we can develop all the more that wonderful spirit of gratitude. And my prayer is this would I find you and find a place in your heart today, this message, as we can go from here grateful for all the things that he's done for us. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, very, very deep words we want to say to you right now. And I'm asking that we would all in our hearts, God, thank you for what you've brought me through. Thank you for my life. And I know you will fulfill the contentment and fulfillment and satisfaction in my life. It's found in you. And Heavenly Father, I pray we live that out today, this week, waking every day, finding those things, developing and increasing those things of which we're grateful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.